Silk Air Flight 185 took off from Jakarta, Indonesia on December 19, 1997 for what was supposed to be an 80-minute flight to Singapore. Piloting the flight were Captain Su Wei Ming, 41, and First Officer Duncan Ward, 23. The first half hour of the flight was uneventful. The weather was calm, and the communications between the pilots and air traffic controllers were normal. However, the flight quickly became anything but routine. 35 minutes after takeoff, Flight 185 abruptly banked sharply to the right and began rapidly descending from its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. The plane crashed into the Musi River in Sumatra, approximately halfway between Jakarta and Singapore, less than a minute later. Locals who witnessed the crash jumped into boats to try to find survivors in the water, but found only small pieces of debris. When Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee, the NTSC, arrived on the scene, they had similar results. They officially confirmed the grim truth that all 104 people on board the flight, 97 passengers and 7 crew members, had perished. Because the Boeing 737 was made in the United States by an American company, the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, became involved in the investigation. The NTSB had extensive experience in both 737 crash investigations and in underwater salvaging, the latter of which proved especially beneficial. The water of the Musi River is very murky, thanks to the deep layers of clay and mud that make up its riverbed. The poor visibility and enveloping riverbed made recovering what remained of the plane almost impossible. Investigators would eventually determine that in the final seconds before Silk Air 185 crashed, it had been traveling faster than the speed of sound. This great power behind the impact forced pieces of debris as far as 15 feet into the thick mud. This created the first major problem facing the investigation, the lack of a debris field. Normally, air crash investigators look at the pattern in which the debris is scattered in order to determine the state the plane was in upon impact and if any pieces had come loose from the main fuselage before impact. For example, investigators can tell that a plane disintegrated on impact if its debris field is relatively small and contained. If a plane had broken apart in the air, its debris field will be spread out over a larger area. Even in cases where a plane has crashed in water, investigators usually can map out a debris field based on components of the plane that float, like seat cushions. The mud and clay at the bottom of the river were so thick that they held down most of even these buoyant objects. This caused a great delay in the mapping of the crash site, which would normally be available to investigators very early on in the investigation. As with any investigation, the most important items to recover from the crash site were the two so-called black boxes, the cockpit voice recorder, CVR, and the flight data recorder, FDR. The CVR records all noises made inside the cockpit, allowing investigators to hear not only what the pilots were saying during the flight and the eventual crash, but also how many and what kind of alarms may have been going off before impact. The FDR provides more technical data about how the plane and all of its systems had been functioning. Humongous cranes were brought in to dredge the bottom of the river for debris, and hopefully locate the two recorders. Understanding the exact nature of Flight 185's sudden dive was of vital importance in determining what component of the plane had potentially failed. Even without the evidence from the FDR, investigators used Indonesian air traffic control data to track Flight 185's flight path and calculate the plane's speed. Planes no longer appear on radar returns when they go below 20,000 feet above ground. As such, investigators only had Flight 185's descent from 35,000 feet to 20,000 feet to examine. Even with this narrowed window, Flight 185's rate of descent was calculated as approximately 30,000 feet per minute. Terrifyingly, the maximum rate of descent for a 737 is normally 7,000 feet per minute. This gross anomaly provided the first major break in the investigation, but also served as a grave reminder of just how terrifying the final seconds on board the plane must have been for the passengers and crew 
The first major pieces of the plane to be recovered were actually found outside of the massive search area in the river, about two and a half miles east of the crash site, deep in the Sumatran rainforest. Investigators found the horizontal stabilizer from Flight 185. Horizontal stabilizers are used to control the pitch of an airplane and are found in its back tail section. The distance from which the horizontal stabilizer fell from the rest of the plane indicated that it came off during the flight. Flight 185 had been flying during good weather and there were no obvious conditions that would have minimized the pilot's visibility. The investigator's initial theory of the crash was that there had been some sort of catastrophic mechanical failure on the plane. This theory made quickly discovering the cause of the crash of Flight 185 of utmost importance. In 1997, the Boeing 737 was one of the most widely flown commercial airliners in the world. Five new 737s came into service every month. Flight 185 had in fact been Silk Air's newest 737, having only been in service for 10 months. If a mechanical flaw inherent in the design of the 737 caused the crash of Flight 185, thousands of lives around the world were in danger every single day. These fears about the safety of the Boeing 737 received added merit from the model's troubled past. The 737 had been involved in several incidents of rudder hardover. Rudder hardover occurs when a plane's rudder, which controls the direction in which the plane's nose is turned, becomes jammed to one side and cannot be controlled by the pilot. By the time of the Silk Air crash, the NTSB had officially attributed the crashes of two 737s, resulting in the combined loss of 157 lives to rudder hardover, and suspected that it played a part in at least two other incidents, which thankfully did not result in any loss of life. The separation of the tail section of Flight 185 would have been consistent with an occurrence of rudder hardover. This possibility raised serious alarm bells for investigators. Boeing had engineered a fix for this problem before the construction of the plane that would eventually serve as Silk Air Flight 185 even began. If this crash had been caused by rudder hardover, then the perceived fix for the problem was in fact no fix at all, and thousands of modified 737s were still prone to rudder hardover. As a result, closely inspecting Flight 185's Power Control Unit, PCU, the piece of the plane that Boeing had modified, to correct the 737's rudder hardover problem became vital to the investigation. Fortunately, the PCU was one of the pieces of the plane that could be recovered from the crash site. The PCU as a whole, and the servo valve within it that had failed in two previous fatal 737 crashes, were available for examination. They were inspected for corrosion, but none was found. Everyone who examined the component found it to be in working order, and rudder hardover was ruled out as a cause of the crash. Investigators now attributed the plane's tail, ripping off of the back of the plane, to its rapid and violent descent, and not to a mechanical failure in the tail itself. While this was good news for Boeing and for 737 passengers around the globe, it left the team working on the Flight 185 case, still without an explanation for the crash. On the fifth day of the investigation, Christmas Eve of 1997, investigators, somewhat miraculously, located the flight data recorder of Flight 185. In an even more seemingly impossible stroke of luck, the cockpit voice recorder was found in the new year, on the very last day the river was being searched. It was buried under 27 feet of mud. Both black boxes appeared to be in usable condition. However, because Indonesia did not have a laboratory capable of analyzing the data on them, the recorders had to be sent to NTSB headquarters in Washington, D.C., creating another delay in the investigation. When the data from the recorders was finally analyzed, three weeks after the crash, it raised more questions than it answered. The FDR had somehow stopped recording while the plane was still in the air. Data was available for the first 34 minutes and 14 seconds of the flight, and it all fell within the expected ranges. After that, there was no data whatsoever. Since the recorder cut off roughly a minute before Flight 185's sudden descent, investigators could not blame the dive for the stopping of the recording. Whatever caused the tape to cut off happened before whatever caused the plane to crash. 
This left the investigative team with one more question it needed the recordings from the CVR to solve. Furthermore, with the loss of the final minutes of FDR data, the CVR was the only means investigators had of gaining insight into the last moments the plane was in the air and what was happening on board Flight 185 during its final, terrifying descent. This loss of information posed a major problem for investigators, but the absence of the recordings itself will become a major clue in piecing together the final minutes of the flight later on in the investigation. Unfortunately, the CVR data was just as puzzling as the FDR data. The first 34 minutes of the recording contained nothing but normal communications, such as the captain's welcome to the passengers over the intercom and the standard checks the captain and the first officer would have gone over together. Neither pilot made any mention of anything unusual happening. Then, like the FDR, the CVR abruptly stopped recording. This was puzzling enough on its own, but the CVR also stopped recording almost six minutes before the FDR did, meaning there had most likely been two different pauses for the two devices ceasing their recording. Because they are built to withstand a plane crash, black boxes are designed to be very durable and dependable. Any kind of power failure that would cause them to stop recording is exceptionally uncommon. There was also no indication that there had been anything wrong with the plane's electrical system, and such a flaw would not have explained the delay between the two units failing, as they were on two different circuits. The odds that both units would independently fail much less right before the plane crashed, were almost too minute to be considered. Investigators began experimenting in a test plane to see if some sort of overload could have shorted the circuit and what effects it would have had on the devices. They discovered that it was possible to overload the circuit, but they also discovered that doing so resulted in a loud sound as the breaker popped. This sound was the last noise on the recording from the CVR on the test plane. However, the sound could not be heard on Flight 185's CVR. With the investigators' possible causes for the failure of the boxes becoming increasingly more limited and simultaneously more disturbing, they ran one more scenario in the test plane, pulling the circuit manually. Doing so did not cause any noise on the recording. Having ruled out a physical cause for the failure of Flight 185's black boxes, Investigators began looking into the unsettling reason why someone in the cockpit would disable the recorders. Lacking data about the plane's performance during its final minutes of flight from the FDR, investigators turned back to alternative sources of information. The radar data was used in a series of test flights in a simulator to determine what exact set of circumstances would result in Flight 185's descent from 35,000 feet to 20,000 feet on the specific path shown by the radar returns. They tested over 20 different scenarios, including various mechanical failures, trying to match the path taken by Flight 185. None of the scenarios, including the initially suspected rudder hardover, fell within the parameters in the radar return data. The only way to get the simulated 737 to drop as steeply and as quickly as Flight 185 did was by having the pilot accelerate and continuously bank the plane sharply to the right. The only explanation for the accident was that it wasn't an accident, but an intentional maneuver made by one of the two pilots. Before going public with such a horrifying theory, investigators began looking for physical evidence to support their version of events. The key piece in confirming that the plane had been in a commanded dive was its jack screw. A jack screw is a part located in the horizontal stabilizer of a plane that rotates when pilots push a switch on their control column. This turning moves the horizontal stabilizer up and down, changing the pitch of the plane. The NTSB was able to calculate the final pitch angle of the stabilizer based on the last setting of the recovered jack screw. The calculations confirmed that the horizontal stabilizer had not been in the expected cruising position it had instead been in the nose-down position. The logical but horrible conclusion was that one of Flight 185's pilots intentionally crashed the plane into the river. According to the CBR, First Officer Duncan Ward had been alone in the cockpit shortly before the crash. 
Captain Su Wei Ming is heard asking his first officer if he would like some water, and telling him that he is heading back into the cabin. The last sound the CVR captured was, rather than the popping noise of the CVR circuit as investigators had been looking for earlier, the sound of the captain's harness buckle clanging against the bottom of his chair as he stood up to leave the cockpit. Indonesian flight traffic controllers confirmed that it was Ward they spoke to when they checked in two minutes before the plane began its fatal dive. However, with these final minutes unaccounted for by the CVR, investigators still had to work to determine who had been at the controls of the plane at the time of the crash. At this point, the investigation turned mainly towards the two pilots and their personal lives, trying to discern any reason as to why either of them would kill not only themselves, but also 103 other people. Interviews with Silk Air staff showed that New Zealand-born First Officer Duncan Ward was generally well-liked and easy to work with. He had no debts, no troubled romantic relationships, and no history of any sort of mental illness. Initially, there was some suspicion that the pressures of living and working so far away from his home country and his entire family may have caused psychological problems for Ward, but his family members insisted that this was not the case. According to them, Duncan had loved flying since he was a teenager, and considered himself very lucky to have the opportunity to make it his career. On paper, Captain Su Wei Ming similarly seemed to have plenty to live for and no motive to sabotage the flight. He was married and the father of three young boys, and, as a former Air Force pilot, had risen through the ranks at Silk Air quickly. However, interviews with other pilots revealed that Captain Su had a reputation for often being willing to cut corners and take chances in order to decrease his flight times. Six months before his death, he had been investigated by the airline because of a sharp landing he had made at an unsafe speed. The landing had been so violent that many of the passengers on board had gotten sick because of it. Captain Su had been demoted from an instructor captain to a regular captain as a result of the investigation. Looking further back into Captain Su's history as a pilot revealed a troubling coincidence. Silk Air Flight 185 had crashed on December 19, 1997. On December 19, 1979, Su Wei Ming, then an Air Force pilot, took off for a training mission with three other fighter pilots. A mechanical problem with his jet caused him to have to turn around and return to base during the course of the mission. His three squadron mates continued on without him. All three died when their planes hit a mountain obstructed from their view by clouds. At least two of the other pilots were believed to have been close friends of Captain Su. Such a heavy loss, and a potential case of survivor's guilt, would have potentially made the date of December 19th highly emotionally charged for the captain. Su Wei Ming's finances also turned out to be a source of pressure at the time of the crash. He had lost over a million dollars in the past four years through high-risk online securities exchanging. He had so many outstanding debts that his trading privileges in the Singapore stock market had been suspended at the time of the crash. On the morning of the crash, he had pledged to repay his large debts as soon as he returned to Singapore. Investigators suddenly had a mountain of motives for Captain Su to want to not only end his life, but also to damage the reputation of Silk Air. However, just because Captain Su had a motive to crash the plane did not mean he actually did. The last known person to be in the cockpit before the crash was First Officer Ward. Furthermore, he had been alone, which would have given him the opportunity to crash the plane. However, these circumstances, in fact, seemed to exonerate him from suspicion. The circuit for the cockpit voice recorder is on the captain's side of the cockpit in a 737. When Captain Sue left the cockpit, his hand would have been within inches of it. He could have easily pulled the circuit to stop the CBR from recording without his first officer noticing. If First Officer Ward had been the one to pull the circuit, the CVR would have recorded the sounds of him unbuckling his harness and getting up to go over to where he could reach it. As such, it is most likely that Captain Sue pulled the circuit as he left the cockpit, as heard at the end of the CVR's recording. It is hard to imagine why the captain would want the CVR to stop recording unless he planned to do something that he would not want there to be a record of, like crash the plane. <laughs> 
It is impossible to know exactly what happened in the final minutes of Flight 185. However, the circumstantial evidence leads investigators to believe that after First Officer Ward completed his last radio call, Captain Sue re-entered the cockpit. He made up a reason to send First Officer Ward into the cabin. Maybe he told him a flight attendant asked to see him, or perhaps he ordered him to take a final break before they needed to plan for landing. After the first officer left, Captain Sue would have locked the door. Pulling the circuit to the FDR, unlike the CVR, causes a loud master alarm. Captain Sue, by disarming the CVR, had shown that he was actively trying to prevent there being any record of what he planned to do. As such, he would have had to disarm the FDR as well. He had to have locked the door so as to prevent First Officer Ward from rushing back into the cockpit and potentially stopping him from crashing the plane when he heard the loud alarm. Captain Sue would have had to use all of his strength to push on the control column enough to cause the sharp descent recorded by the radar data, and he would not have been able to accomplish it while fighting off his first officer. Without the CVR, it is impossible to know if Ward tried to re-enter the cockpit to help when he heard the alarm, or if he had realized what was going on when he found the door to be locked. Since Captain Sue sent the plane into its final dive less than a minute after disarming the FDR, it is possible that Ward did not even have a chance to make it back to the door and try to re-enter the cockpit. It is probable, however, that First Officer Ward was standing at the time. Being unsecured by a seatbelt or a harness, he would have likely been slammed into the ceiling of the cabin when the plane began its sharp bank. First Officer Ward could very well have been deceased or unconscious within seconds of the beginning of the plane's descent, unable to do anything to try to prevent it. Indonesia's NTSC released its report about Flight 185 three years after the crash. Shockingly, the formal report disregarded the evidence presented by investigators and announced that no cause of the crash was discovered. The report claimed that there was insufficient evidence to determine a cause for the accident because the final minutes of the flight were not recorded. The NTSB publicly contradicted this report by issuing one of their own. The NTSB report cited a deliberate act on the part of Su Wei Ming as the cause of the crash and detailed the evidence with which that determination was reached, challenging both the notion that the cause of the accident was unknown and that there was insufficient evidence to reach a conclusion about what had transpired to bring down the plane. There are obvious biases that could be influencing these differing opinions. The NTSC publicly blaming a pilot flying out of their country's main airport for bringing down a plane could have potentially damaged customer confidence in commercial air travel. The airport Flight 185 had taken off from alone serviced over 18 million passengers a year at the time of the crash. The NTSC had an obvious motive to try to protect the large and rapidly expanding Indonesian air travel industry. Similarly, the NTSB had motive to protect Boeing, the makers of the 737, from civil lawsuits and the loss of its strong reputation. Allegations that the NTSB report was fabricated to protect the company persist to this day. Boeing was, and still is, one of the largest manufacturers of commercial airliners in the world and also had, and has, large aerospace and defense operations, including numerous contracts with the United States government. In 1997, the year of the Flight 185 crash, Boeing employed almost a quarter of a million people and generated almost $46 billion in revenue. The company had weathered the crisis of the two U.S. 737 crashes because it had corrected the problem with the model servo valve once it was discovered. If Boeing had incorrectly addressed this problem, the impact on its reputation, and therefore its sales, could have been catastrophic. Since that could lead to the loss of thousands of American jobs and severely damage the U.S. economy, the NTSB could have been biased against blaming the crash on a mechanical failure. Both agencies had serious economic and governmental pressures on the results they reported. Despite the conflicting reports issued by their government agencies, both American and Indonesian members of the team that actually investigated the crash take the available evidence to mean that Flight 185 was brought down by an intentional command, most likely by Captain Su Wei Ming. Furthermore, the NTSB report was authored by Greg Fife, 
who had been directly involved with the investigation and had personally dealt with the evidence. The NTSC report, on the other hand, had been released by the head of the committee, who would have been more aware of and concerned with the political and economic consequences of the committee's ruling. On top of the two conflicting conclusions about the cause of the crash presented by the two government agencies that were in charge of the investigation, blame was assigned to another party in 2004. A jury in a Los Angeles Superior Court concluded that the servo valve in the PCU was what brought down the plane. They ordered Parker Hannafin, the manufacturer of the PCU, to pay the three families who had brought the suit $43.6 million. The servo valve had been suspected early in the investigation into the crash of Flight 185 because problems with it had resulted in two previous 737 crashes. The NTSC, NTSB, and Parker Hannafin had all examined the servo valve and surrounding PCU and found it to be in working order. Inspection of the rudder also showed no signs of rudder hardover, the condition the failure of the servo valve would have caused. The evidence collected by the NTSB and the report it issued evaluating it were not allowed into evidence in the Los Angeles case. As such, jurors did not hear about the conclusion that Flight 185 was brought down intentionally, nor did they have access to the majority of the evidence available about Flight 185 because it was collected as part of the official investigation. Lacking the majority of the information about Flight 185's crash, the main source of information in the trial was testimony from a metals expert hired as part of a private investigation for the lawsuit. The expert presented photographs from a scanning electron microscope showing chips in the servo valve of the PCU recovered from Flight 185. This expert also testified that these microscopic chips could have interfered with the operation of the plane's rudder, leading to rudder hardover and the crash. However, it is impossible to know if these microscopic flaws would have someday led to the crash of this particular 737. It is also hard to determine if these chips were present before the violent crash or were a result of it. Parker Hannafin initially announced that it would appeal the Los Angeles verdict. However, they eventually decided to settle out of court and pay an unspecified amount of money to each family involved in the crash. They did not, however, ever accept any liability for the crash of Flight 185. In addition to the settlement from Parker Hannafin, each victim's family received $100,000 US dollars from Silk Air and an undisclosed amount of compensation from Boeing. Because the NTSC report did not implicate Su Wei Ming in the crash, his family received the entirety of his death benefits. The cause of the crash of Silk Air 185 will probably always be a source of controversy. However, the evidence collected during the investigation most comprehensively points to the loss of the plane and all those on board, as being a result of Captain Su Wei Ming intentionally piloting the plane into the Musi River. While the NTSB's evidence for its version of events is circumstantial, it is overwhelming. <laughs>